Claude Rains as Captain Paul. The story of John Paul Jones on the Cavalcade of America, presented by DuPont, maker of better things for better living through chemistry. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Clayton Collier. Today, as we all know, the nation celebrates the birthday of the United States Navy. 166 years ago, in the year 1775, the Continental Congress voted funds for two ships and took the first step towards establishing American naval power. Thus began the illustrious tradition of heroic deeds and heroic men, the United States Navy. Tonight, the Cavalcade of America, sponsored by DuPont, brings you a play about a man who was a symbol of this great tradition. Adapted for radio from Commander Edward Ellsberg's bestseller, we present Captain Paul, the story of John Paul Jones, starring the distinguished actor Claude Rains. <laughs> The year 1775, in a great hallway of an old mansion in His Majesty's Colony of Virginia. Oh, John, my breath. Let me get my breath. One more kiss, Dorothy, and I'm ready to face a thousand fathers. There. Now let's go into his study and tell him. Take my hand. Isn't it a very small thing to ask for? Yes, the world. And you're mine, John. Now then. Ready? Let's get it over with. Father? Oh, yes? What is it, Dorothea? Uh, John and I would like to see you a minute. Certainly, of course. Come on in. Sit down. Now, what can I do for you, Jones? Father, John has something to say to you. Well, let him say it. I will, sir. I wish to marry your daughter. Well, that's a matter we'll have to discuss. Dorothea, uh, do you remember that piece of property over in the southeast corner of the estate? Oh, yes, Father. That's where you will build your home. Excuse me, sir, but uh, Dorothea and I have other plans. We, we're going up north, sir. I hope to get a ship and go to sea. Well, I was under the impression you wanted to get married. And that means settling down, unless I'm mistaken. My daughter is going to marry a gentleman, sir. Look out that window, Jones. You see a lot of pretty fine property, don't you? That's all going to be my daughter someday. Her husband will have to accept that responsibility. But I have no interest in becoming a landowner, sir. My career is on the sea. Well, then you and I are wasting time here. Ah, I hope to prove you wrong, sir. But with the revolution coming, there's more important work for me to do than managing a farm. Maybe you haven't heard about it, sir, but there's going to be a new America soon. Rot. Do you think that all Virginians are excited about what they're doing in Rhode Island or Massachusetts these days? But I'm trying to tell you that America is going to be free, sir. That there's, there's going to be a war. That we'll have an army. That we're starting a navy. And I'm going to help establish it. And that Dorothea and I are leaving here tomorrow. You're wrong. You, sir, are leaving now, right now. My daughter's not going to throw her life away on a hot-headed fool with a toy boat. Father. Good day, Mr. Jones. I'm very busy. Come along, Dorothea. Darling, I'm going now. But I'll come back to you someday. And he'll see it our way then. Will you wait for me, Dorothea? Oh, I'll wait, John. I'll wait. Captain White of His Majesty's Royal Navy. Captain Jones of the Continental Navy. I congratulate you on your victory, sir. My thoughts. Thank you, Captain. The American Navy is so young and impoverished, you could probably use it. But you better keep it. Thank you, sir. I'd like to ask you a question or two. Certainly. 
Where was your ship bound, sir? Boston. Your cargo? Our stores are sizable, sir. Shoes, uniforms, food, powder, and cannon. Captain Jones, I've never struck my flag before, and I... I still can't understand how you outmaneuvered me to windward. Your ship, I see, is not exactly first class. They say beginner's luck always is, sir. Then I'm your first prize, Captain Jones? No, sir. You are number eight. There have been seven others. Captain Jones reporting to Commodore Hopkins. Captain Jones, I'm glad to see you back in Newport. Is the ship all right? Sir, I have the honor to report to you that in six weeks at sea, we captured eight enemy vessels. Now I'd like the wages for my crew. Now? You know better than that. There isn't a pound for wages. Then suppose we settle it this way. I'll take an advance on the cargoes we captured. The crew is pledged to receive one-third value on all captured cargo. As to that, two-thirds goes for maintenance of the Navy. It may be months before Congress and the courts can dispose of a single shilling. Delay, delay. There's no delay in your asking me to fire a cannon. I suppose you wouldn't know about firing a cannon, Commodore. You will address me as befits the Commodore of the Continental Fleet, Captain Jones. What fleet? Those six sloops rotting in the harbor? I tell you, I want a better ship if I'm going to carry out these, this sea raiding as it should be done. You don't know how lucky you are. And a lot more important men than yourself with better connections can't get a ship anywhere. Now, uh, are you going to turn over that cargo to me? Or shall I be forced to relieve you of command? And shall I tell you there's a war going on, Commodore? The country's bleeding to death. And you know it. But so long as they don't bombard Philadelphia Harbor, it's business as usual and the devil with liberty. Lick the heels of any tyrant, but get your gold out of it. And forget about the poor clods fighting to make men free. Get out of here, Jones, and don't come back. You won't get rid of me. My crew's outside. What if I tell them the Commodore of the Continental Fleet's grabbing two-thirds of the cargo for the Navy and letting the men wait? No. Wait a minute, Jones. You, uh, want a better ship, you say? I do. Suppose I give you one we've just acquired from the French, the Amphitrite. I think this paper will make everything satisfactory. That's better. Good day, Commodore. Morning, Captain. The Navy has commissioned me to take over the infantry. Here are my papers. Yes. Yes, I see. Speed is hell I ever laid eyes on, sir. I'll be off at once. Along with raiding, I'm I'm to be head for Paris. Dr. Franklin must be given news of Burgoyne's surrender at Saratoga. Good. I'm sailing the ship to France next week. I'm sure you'll enjoy being a passenger. You better look at that paper again, Captain. You're turning your ship over to me. Oh, no. That isn't what that paper says. It just says you can take command. I don't see any paper which tells me to give up my ship to anyone. Well, can't you infer that if I'm to take command, you'll have to give it up? Give my ship away on inference? You can't do that without another paper that says I can. No, sir. You show me a paper that states that in plain language, and I'll turn my ship over to you. Paper. Paper. The country's dying, and you're talking about a paper. You and the rest like you. Bunglers, money grubbers, politicians. Everybody afraid of the one above him. Afraid for his skin, afraid for his pocket. Can Washington load his muskets with paper? Will paper break the blockade? By heaven, if it's not this ship, it'll be another paper or no paper. Is this a war? Or are we all playing with paper dolls? You are listening to The Cavalcade of America, starring Claude Rains in Captain Paul, brought to you by DuPont, maker of better things for better living through chemistry. As our play continues, we find John Paul Jones calling on Dr. Benjamin Franklin, the American envoy in Paris. And the news is, Dr. Franklin, General Burgoyne surrendered his entire army at Saratoga. Wonderful. Wonderful. Now the French will join us for sure. 
Good news indeed, my boy, good news. Uh, and now, tell me your plans. Dr. Franklin, I think you realize now we'll be able to finish the war quickly. And I'm sure you see the need for American naval power to do it. The fact is, if I had command of a squadron... A squadron would be very nice, Captain Jones. But uh, no doubt you've heard of politicians. To my sort of. Who hasn't? If you were a politician, you might have inferred from my reaction to your request that... Well, the point is you've been relieved of your command of your own ship. What? Jones, there's an old saying. Bad news runs swiftly. Apparently it outran your ship this voyage. You see, your first lieutenant, Mr. Simpson, is something of a politician. My first lieutenant, sir, is a drunken fool. Command a ship of war? Well, he can't tell the difference between starboard and a teacup. Do you think I'm going to lie down while he walks over my back? Well, why not roll over? Out of the way, then, Jones. Meanwhile, enjoy yourself in Paris. I'll be hanged if I stay here in Paris with a war to be fought. You will stay here, Jones. Because I think there's a chance I can get you another ship. At least for the present, I'm reasonably certain of it. But I've got to do something about the crew. Am I to keep paying for crews out of my own pocket? I can't go on forever like that. I think you'll go on, Jones. Like the rest of us, you can't help yourself. Dr. Franklin, I have gone on. I've gone on here in Paris, dreaming about that ship for the last seven months. Haven't you any words, sir? Jones, your dreams are over. You're in command of a squadron. At last. Now for some action. Still, Jones, it would do you well to remember there are ships and ships. What do you mean, sir? Well, let me put it this way. True, you have a squadron. It is equally true, nevertheless, that you will be joined by four French captains, each commanding his own vessel. As to your own ship, Jones, well, if they refer to vessels as females, we might call her a dowager of the seas. In fact, she's 60 years old. Guess that must be the one Columbus overlooked. He sure she floats. <laughs> oh, they say she floats. But I think if you're taking her anywhere, you'll have to look around for sail. If I'm going to do any fighting, I suppose I'll have to pluck a few cannon out of the air. What's a miracle or two? One smashing victory and you'll go home a hero. I want to go home, sir. Doesn't a hero always need a heroine? Then don't waste time, my boy. Go back and marry her. You can tell her you named the ship for her. Don't you suppose I've had a name ready all these months? What are you going to call her, Joan? She'll fight with your name, sir. She'll be the Paul Richard. <laughs> Thank you, Joan. Uh, and we'll say good luck and a great sail for the Bonhomme Richard. Off the port bow, sir. Up we go, Mr. Stacy. I say. How big is she? Well, you'll see better through your glass, sir. There. There she rides around the circle of the land. Hey, she's a big lady, Jack. I see right. Why, she's the flagship of the British Baltic Fleet. Look. Our squadron's running away. They're turning to the wind. Let the French go, the yellow dogs. That warship's too big for us. Alone. Nothing's too big for us today. Mr. Jackson, up with the gun ports. Up with the gun ports. Beat to quarters, Mr. Stacy. Beat to quarters. Clear the deck. Mr. Carroll. Second deck to it. Hold on the lights, Mr. Anderson. Right the boys. Lay the boarding decks. Hold it to it, lads. Shh. 
ship's cleared for action, sir. Good. She's closing in on us, sir. Mighty close. The closer, the better. Hit her with a stone right now. Hey, look at it, All right, sir. Listen. Look to it, you can even hear them giving orders. I shall be smack into us in a minute, sir. Are the men ready? Aye, sir. Ahoy! What ship are you? Listen, Mr. Stacy. Aye, sir. When she gets a little closer, we'll throw the grappling hooks into her and board. I say, what ship are you? It's Mercy Ship Service. Captain Richard Pilsen. Stun ports are still closed. In another minute, we'll have him blanketed. Aye, sir. Ahoy there. Where are you bound? Come closer. I can't hear you. Answer directly, my right fire. We have him, Mr. Stacy. We'll smother his guns in the collision. He means it all right. Look. Grappling hook, sir. Not yet. Up with the gun, boss. Aye, aye, sir. She's going to fire. We'll be blown to bits this closer. Now, Mr. Stacy. Grappling hooks, boys. Throw them into it. Right, there it goes. Don't fly, lads. Order. Order. Pistols and cutlasses. That was their stern gun, sir. Guess we couldn't travel them all. Any damage? Looks pretty bad from here. The full of water. We're sinking. The ship's on fire. Captain Jones, sir. The shot has carried away our flag. Oh, you rebel pirate. Do you surrender? Never. I've just begun to fight! Jones! Jones, you must have been a wizard. Taking an old hulk like that and winning in spite of it. A great victory, my boy. That old hulk, as you call it, Dr. Franklin, how could she fail when she bears your name? Well, you see, Paris has turned out in your honor, and that's fine. You deserve everything. So don't delay. Go home and triumph. I dare say your friends will be delighted. Uh, oh, by the way, here's a packet of letters for you from America. Oh, thank you, sir. Well, let me see that one from Virginia. Excuse me, sir, will you? Surely. What's the matter, John? Dear John, Miss Dorothy is no more. That is, a few months ago, she gave herself into the arms of Patrick Henry. Oh, I'm sorry, John. Patrick Henry. He's a great gentleman, isn't he, Dr. Franklin? Great gentleman of Virginia. Uh, John, let me give you some advice. The ambassador from the Imperial Russian court has been to see me. It seems your fame has reached the ears of the Empress Catherine. She wants you in St. Petersburg as admiral of her Black Sea Fleet. There wasn't much point in it then, but now... There'd be money in that. How would that help? Money and a way to forget. I assure you, the Empress is not, uh, uh, how shall I say, dull. No, I'm not, how shall I say, a fool. At least, as far as ships are concerned. are my private apartments. As you well know, Admiral Jones. Now, when will you American louts learn some manners? Softly, my lady, softly. Now, what have I done? Why do you suppose I brought you in here? I do not propose to be shouted at before my ministers like a common scullery mate. It was a mistake to bring up the subject of finances. I lost my head for a minute. Let's forget all about it. Shall we? So, I forgive you. John Paul, hasn't Russia taught you anything? Many things, my lady. And, after all, haven't I taught Russia something? <laughs> yes. We owe so much to each other, John Paul. It's just that I've been worried lately, but... Perhaps I need a rest. Oh, there's nothing to worry about, nothing at all. Why do you worry, John Paul? 
haven't I made you an admiral of the Russian fleet? And hasn't Russia repaid you well this month? Is that not so? Oh, your imperial majesty, I, I want what is due me. I, I want that and nothing else. So, now you listen to me, my little admiral. Catherine has never been accustomed to treating her favorites like servants. They've all had my friendship, my protection. You are going to be a despicable exception. <laughs> admiral of my fleet, are you? Yes, you will continue as admiral. But you won't even have a, a barge, a common barge to command. You will not die in action. But of inaction, I promise you. Now go. I leave tomorrow. That gives you time to get the money ready. You have no tomorrow in Russia, Mr. Jones. You leave St. Petersburg tonight. Go back to your America to work if you dare. That lovely free country you've done so much for. But not with my money. You will never have power again. Not as long as I am empress of all the Russias. Now try to rest, Monsieur Jones. You are tired. Did you find a doctor? I have tried all over Paris. But the doctors, they will not come while there is rioting in the street. Why should they come? See me die. But, Monsieur Jones, have you no friend? No one to give you a... a... You mean... Is there no one to bury me? I have no friend. You've been very good and kind to me. I leave you nothing. <coughs> Tell me. They're still fighting in the streets. Paris is reason, they say. Long live the revolution. But people are dying. We all die, old woman. Does it matter how? Those people out there. Dying as I am. Dreaming the same dream I did long ago. In America. Freedom. The great ghost no man can shackle. I began my life in one revolution. I die. Dorothea, your hand, my darling, a very small thing, so was my life without it. Claude Rains. Ladies and gentlemen, in a moment our star will return to the microphone with an interesting announcement. But first, I'd like to bring you a message that is important for all of us. All uniforms aren't cocky colored. The pair of white overalls a painter wears is a uniform too. A painter is a defender. A brush and a can of paint protect America. Protect it today more than ever because today we must keep our American industrial plants running at top efficiency. We don't want deterioration to slow a single plant. Paint is the protection against deterioration. Here again, we come upon the word that is so often used these days, conservation. With America all out for defense, every precaution must be taken against the rust and rot that represent the fifth column in industry, tearing down and destroying while industry builds. Here, paint tackles the job of conservation. Nor does that job end with mere surface protection of factory buildings. 
Paint on storage tanks protects against rust and also reduces losses by evaporation. The painted pipes in a modern manufacturing plant, bright red and blue and green, can be traced easily and repaired quickly in the event of a break. Paint in a contrasting color on the moving part of a lathe or a drill press warns the man at the machine against danger spots, preventing an injury that might invalid him out of the production line. On that other great production front, the farms that feed America, there, too, paint is at work protecting, conserving, whether as white enamel on the inside of a milk house or as paint on a tractor that must work and stand out in the rain and sun. And down the straight ribbons that link America's production and consumption, down the airways and highways and seaways, there again paint protects and conserves. It may be the paint on a freight car. It may be the painted stripe or stop sign at a highway intersection. It may be the ship and deck paint that resists salt spray and harbor gases and stretches out time between repaintings. The job in all cases is the same, conservation. In your own home as well, paint works for conservation. It protects wood and cuts your repair costs. A well-painted house costs less to heat, especially a house built of porous brick or stucco. And a room painted with light colors on the walls and ceiling can be lighted with fewer electric bulbs. No small matter in these times when every kilowatt of electric current should be saved. Linoleums, window screens, concrete floors, and front steps wear longer when they're protected by paints designed for the job. And it's worth remembering that when you paint now, you conserve valuable steel and wood. Paint is an important product of chemistry and DuPont. DuPont paints are scientifically made, designed in modern laboratories by skilled chemists. With their enduring colors and resistant protective films, DuPont paint products contribute once again better things for better living through chemistry. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we'd like you to meet our star, Claude Rains. Well, Mr. Rains, we're glad to have you back again on Cavalcade. Well, Mr. Collier, I enjoyed the opportunity of being with you all again. And with the help of my old friends, the Cavalcade players, I hope that tonight's show, dedicated to a great man and a great tradition, has contributed something to the commemoration of Navy Day. Well, we certainly trust you're right, Mr. Raines, and we'd like to congratulate you for your part in recalling to us the heroism of one of those men who made our Navy great. Thank you, Mr. Collier. Now I'd like to bring your radio audience that interesting uh, announcement you spoke about. Before I left Hollywood to come here for the show, I saw a preview screening of the new Warner Brothers picture you're doing on Cavalcade next week. It's called One Foot in Heaven. One of the most delightful stories they've ever filmed in Hollywood. And in it, my good friend, Frederick March, turns in one of the greatest starting performances of his career. Thank you, Claude Rains. <laughs> Remember, on next week's Cavalcade, One Foot in Heaven, starring Frederick March. Our play tonight was based on Captain Paul by Commander Edward Ellsberg, published by Dodd, Mead & Company, to whom Cavalcade gratefully acknowledges its obligation for new material. The orchestra and the original musical score were under the direction of Don Voorhees. On the Cavalcade of America, your announcer is Clayton Collier, sending best wishes from DuPont. <laughs> This is the Red Network of the National Broadcasting Company.